Hello, I'm Lindsay Hookway. I'm a paediatric nurse, health visitor, international board certified lactation consultant and gentle sleep coach. And this presentation should help you if you're currently dealing with a baby on a nursing strike or who is refusing to go to the breast. So first of all, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. Um, it's very, very hard to remain impartial and impassive when your baby is refusing to breastfeed. Um, it, sometimes women describe this to me as um, it's almost it feels like your baby is rejecting you or your, your love for them. Um, and there is nothing more frustrating than um, wanting to breastfeed and trying to breastfeed, but for whatever reason, whether it's sudden, whether it's been from the beginning or whether it's come on slowly, um, that your baby um, fusses and cries and won't go on the breast. Um, it's extremely demoralising and you have my um, full sympathy. Um, coupled with the um, unbelievable um, raging hormones um, that most women experience after giving birth, if, if your um, baby's nursing strike has, has been right from the word go, um, then this is doubly hard to deal with because not only are you handling the baby blues but um, you've also, um, you're also you're trying to establish breastfeeding with a baby who won't breastfeed so um, uh, please go and, and find support um, it, it's, it's great that you're watching this video but you probably need somebody who can um, physically see you and support you in person so do find um, uh, a local um, clinic or a drop-in where you can go and get support from other mums who've gone through this and um, maybe a professional as well. Um, and it's also really important that um, you find out um, what people can do for you. So um, get people to look after you, um, get them to do stuff that you don't have to do. So um, get people to do the housework for you or accept offers to um, pick up your other children or invite your older children for play dates or whatever because um, you really need to look after yourself. Um, it's really hard work being a mum at the best of times but um, if you're dealing with um, something like this then you really really do need a support crew around you. So to start with it helps to find out why this has happened. So if you think back to the last time your baby breastfed well um, and be a bit of a detective, so um, uh, think about whether something's changed for your baby, think about whether something's changed for you. Um, so sometimes um, it's uh, an older baby who has perhaps taken a bite um, during um, the end of feeding, and, and you probably know that babies actually can't physically bite, um, when they're actively feeding, but they certainly can if they're not actually feeding. Um, and most of the time babies do this at the end of a feed. Um, and sometimes if, if mums understandably um, get cross or yelp or um, immediately take their baby off and, and react in quite um, uh, a forceful way, then babies can get a little bit upset and a little bit um, uh, surprised by this. Um, and that can trigger um, uh, a nursing strike. So um, some of the um, following strategies that I'm going to cover might help you. Um, if your baby has never fed well, um, so perhaps you had a tricky birth, um, perhaps something happened soon after birth and actually you've never really had a good feed, um, then hopefully you too can find some solutions as well. But um, just, you know, try and rule out some things that it could be um, because then what you're left with is um, what's more likely to be your problem. So a lot of times um, the problem is related to um, flow preference, which we'll talk about later, um, which can go hand in hand with babies um, getting used to suckling on silicone or latex. Um, so we'll talk about how to minimise the impact on breastfeeding by bottle feeding in the right way. Sometimes a baby with a tongue tie will get very fussy on the breast because it's not comfortable for them. Um, so if you think that might be a problem for you, then um, have your baby checked by somebody who is qualified um, to check for tongue tie. Um, a really common cause of breast refusal is um, sometimes when people try and help you to breastfeed, especially in the early days, um, 
sometimes somebody will, in all good intention, um, try to help your baby by pushing them um, on the back of their head. And um, this is a really common cause of breast refusal because um, a baby's natural instinct when they're near the breast is to tip their head back. Um, it's a reflexive behaviour which um, you'll know if you've watched my video on how to position your baby for a pain-free feed. Um, and so if you imagine somebody trying to override one of your natural reflexes, um, you'd understandably be pretty angry about that. And babies can get very, very confused, very angry uh, when somebody pushes on the back of their head. And quite often it'll be a professional, unfortunately, um, and then um, mums and dads um, assume that that must be the right way of getting their baby on the breast. So they carry on following that example set to them by uh, a health professional um, and not realising that actually the situation is going to get worse. Um, so um, if that's you, then again, you have my um, heartfelt sympathy um, and this is certainly not um, a judgement on on you because if, if nobody has told you how to um, not hold your baby's head, then um, how would you know otherwise that that was not the best thing to do? Um, so sometimes it's just that the baby isn't positioned well and they're not comfortable. Um, again, um, uh, rather than repeat myself in, in this presentation, um, uh, this is covered in the uh, positioning your baby and also um, how to achieve a pain-free feed. Um, so have a look at those if you're not sure. Um, sometimes babies get a bit upset if they're not held securely as well. Um, I, I sort of liken um, that cradle hold position for the baby as being a little bit like being a beetle on its back. And if you've ever seen a ladybird um, on its back the wrong way round, those little legs um, flail around in the air. And that's a little bit like how a baby behaves um, when he or she is on his back. Um, with the breast above them in that cradle hold um, position and quite often you can sort that out by just leaning back um, and uh, allowing your baby um, to uh, be supported on the mother's body and using gravity to pull the baby towards the mother rather than in that cradle hold position where gravity is actually pulling the baby towards the floor. Sometimes there's something strange like um, mum has changed her deodorant or her perfume. Um, it might be something a little bit random like that. And occasionally babies will go on a nursing strike right before mum's period um, comes back, either for the first time or um, uh, at subsequent times. Um, and that's because sometimes the milk supply drops just a tiny bit um, temporarily during your period. And sometimes the milk can taste a little bit different to usual. So sometimes that will um, bug a baby as well. So you need to figure out what has happened. Um, so has your baby ever fed well? And if so, what has changed since your baby last fed well? Um, and then you'll be able to pick the right solution for you. So um, it, step by step, um, to get your baby back to breastfeeding, First of all, you need to start with a calm baby. Um, it's absolutely no point um, trying to persuade um, an angry, frustrated, hungry baby to go on the breast. It's not going to happen. So if you're getting into um, a bit of a fight with your baby at the breast, um, uh, perhaps you need to try a different approach because um, the more fights you have at the breast, um, the more your baby um, will uh, start to associate the breast with somewhere and some thing that's actually quite negative. So um, you need to have a calm baby. It also helps um, if your milk supply is normal. Um, so sometimes when uh, babies don't feed well, what can happen is because you don't empty milk from the breast, actually your milk supply can drop a little bit. Um, so it's really important to protect your milk supply during breast refusal. And you're going to need a lot of patience. Um, we've already talked about tackling the root cause of the problem. Um, and when you know what the problem is and you have a plan, that will help you to be calm because you really need to be calm um, if you're trying to calm your baby down. Uh, babies are extremely perceptive 
and they always know when their mum is stressed out. They can feel it in um, our muscle tension, they can feel it through our um, increased heart rate and our breathing rate, um, they can hear it in the tone of our voice. Um, so there's lots of ways that babies pick up on this, no matter how good an act we think we're putting on. So rather than fake it, um, you are going to need to find ways to um, stay calm or get calm um, if you're getting stressed out. So the first rule always um, is feed the baby. Um, you absolutely have to keep your baby fed um, for their health and well-being. Um, so uh, there's lots of reasons for that. Number one, obviously, it's to um, make sure they're adequately nourished and hydrated, but also um, trying to master something that is not going well um, will not work with a really hungry baby because um, they will not be patient with learning a new skill um, or uh, changing a pattern of behaviour. Um, they will become frustrated and start fighting um, so you definitely don't want to get into a battle. So um, the first choice uh, would be that you would express and give your baby your milk um, and the second choice, um, according to the World Health Organization, would be donor milk. Um, so uh, there are ways of obtaining donor breast milk outside of a neonatal unit. And um, there are lots of organizations such as um, Human Milk for Human Babies and Eats on Feet. Um, and th these are um, women who are very willing to just give away their excess expressed breast milk. So uh, if you would consider that, then that is an option for you. Um, it's a very personal choice, so um, that's not for everybody. And then the next choice would be um, a liquid ready to feed first infant formula. Um, and you, the liquid ones would be recommended over a powdered infant formula because they're already um, uh, sterilized by irradiation. Um, so they're sterile until they're opened, um, whereas the powder isn't sterile even before it's opened. So um, it's slightly safer for your baby to have um, liquid formula. And whatever formula you use, you should choose a first infant formula. Um, so they, they don't ever need um, a hungry baby formula or a follow-on, um, anything like that. You just need a first infant milk and also you want to feed your baby in a style that's supportive of breastfeeding. Um, so we'll um, discuss a few alternatives um, uh, to breastfeeding if your baby will not go on the breast. So um, before we rush straight into thinking about bottle feeding, there are other options out there. So just so you know um, what options you have available to you, um, you could cup feed. Um, you probably want to just um, ask a health professional how to cup feed or um, watch a video. Um, there's loads of videos on YouTube about how to cup feed. Um, you basically you do not pour the milk into your baby's mouth. That's dangerous. Um, essentially, you tip the um, cup so that the milk is level with the edge of the baby's mouth. And then you wait for your baby to lick the milk. And it's actually um, more similar to the way a baby uses their mouth and tongue when they breastfeed, which is why it's a really good solution for a baby who can't be breastfed, um, because it uh, maintains some of the um, skills that they use when they're breastfeeding. Another option um, is the supplemental nursing system, which is this device on um, the right hand side. Um, or you could try a Lactaid. Um, so there are a couple of companies that make them. Essentially, it's um, you, you wear the bottle or the, the bag, in the case of the lactate, around your neck um, and you attach the silicon tubes um, near your nipple with um, tape that's provided with the, um, the uh, supplemental device. And then um, you attach your baby to the breast using um, the supplemental um, uh, so that the tube is in their mouth as well as um, your breast and nipple tissue. Um, and the reason this sometimes works with a nursing strike is if a baby is frustrated with the flow rate out of the breast. 
Um, so that happens quite a lot if babies have had a lot of bottles, for example. Um, so if babies have had um, bottles where the, the flow has been extremely quick, um, they can sometimes refuse to go on the breast because the flow rate isn't fast enough. So it might even be that you have a normal milk supply, um, but actually the flow rate uh, is just not what your baby has become used to. And sometimes that will make babies fuss and cry and pull off and arch and squirm um, and they get very upset and distressed. Um, so a supplemental nursing system uh, might help with that because it would increase the flow rate. Um, and in time, uh, you can begin to slow down the flow rate from the supplemental device by um, uh, lowering the bottle, the bottle so that... Um, the, the, the milk flows more slowly and the baby slowly adapts to your normal flow rate out of your breast. If it's a very young baby, um, you could consider um, supplementing your baby with a syringe because um, at very, very small volumes, it might be easier and more practical um, to um, syringe feed your baby. Some mothers also choose to finger feed their babies. Um, uh, and obviously that's something that other people other than the mother can do, so um, she can be concentrating on expressing. Um, but th there are lots of ways of feeding babies that don't involve bottles. Now, um, on to bottle feeding. So um, bottles are not the bad guys, but it's definitely true that the way we use bottles can either make breastfeeding harder or be more protective of breastfeeding. So in the picture on the left, um, that's how a lot of people um, <coughs> uh, see babies being bottle fed. So the baby being quite um, reclined, maybe not completely flat, but the, the baby is often very reclined with the bottle held um, nice and high uh, so that no air gets in the teat, right? Um, and the thought is that if there's air in the teat that the baby will get wind now, in practice, what tends to happen in this position is that milk flows really, really quickly. And you know that because if you hold a bottle upside down, milk will just begin to drip from the teat without you even doing anything. And if you apply any pressure on the teat at all, uh, milk will gush out. So when a baby is held in this position with the bottle held upright like that, um, usually the feed is very quick and the baby will go <coughs> without really um, stopping and pausing and managing their appetite well. So it's a very easy way of overfeeding a baby. Um, it's also really stressful for babies because if they've got milk pouring into their mouth, they basically have three options and that is drink, drown or dribble. And so if you see your baby with a, a sort of a wide-eyed, surprised kind of look or um, starting to flap their arms or legs or squirm, um, if they avoid your eye contact, uh, if you start seeing milk dribbling out of the corners of your baby's mouth, um, those are actually all signs of stress in your baby. Um, and again, it, if, if if you're watching this thinking, oh my goodness, that's how I've been bottle feeding, it's not your fault because if nobody has told you, um, how on earth could you possibly know? Um, so, you know, when we know a better way, we can do a better way, but this is definitely not about um, blaming or shaming anybody. Um, so if you uh, are trying to be supportive of breastfeeding um, and actually any bottle fed baby should be fed in this way as well because it helps them to uh, protect their airway and manage their appetite better is something called paste bottle feeding um, and basically you hold your baby very upright you want to nestle them really close um, because feeding should be a nurturing and lovely time with your baby it shouldn't be uh, you know a job to get done as quickly as possible and what you would do is hold the bottle as horizontally as possible and you um, allow your baby to suckle slowly and calmly and when your baby um, stops suckling actively on the teat you lower the teat in their mouth so that um, the baby is not uh, suckling um, 
uh, on milk constantly. You want them to be able to pause. Um, and so when you lower that teat, um, a lot of people worry that the baby is then going to suck air. But if you think about it, babies breathe through their noses, not through their mouths predominantly. So when you, um, when you lower that bottle, when the baby isn't suckling, they're going to be breathing in and out normally through their nose and managing their airway normally. Um, it's less stressful for the baby. And then when you begin to see the baby um, start to suckle um, on uh, his or her teat again, you go ahead and you just tip the bottle back up slightly so that milk begins to fill the end of the teat again and the baby will feed again. But you definitely want that feed to take at least 15 minutes um, so that the baby has a chance to pause and um, feed slowly and this will correct that expectation of um, a really really fast flowing uh, milk flow on the breast. So this is often the first thing um, that I would need to help um, families with if they've got a baby who's refusing the breast is we would change the way that the bottles are given. Um, and that's not going to be a quick fix but it's definitely going to stop the problem from getting worse and it's going to help us to get the baby back to the breast again. Um, so um, uh, if you haven't already been doing so then switch to paste bottle feeding um, and hopefully that will help your baby. So um, other ways of calming your baby, um, I'll talk a little bit later on about starting with the bottle or the supplement, um, however you're going to give it, um, and then putting the baby on the breast. Um, but you can also just try just reducing the stimulation. So dim lighting, soft, quiet voices, um, lots of skin to skin. You could try lying down to feed, that sometimes works. Um, you could try allowing your baby to attach themselves. Um, you could try bouncing on a yoga ball whilst feeding. That might sound crazy, but um, that is often a really good way of distracting babies with a, a big sensory um, uh, signal um, that helps them to be able to organise their feeding better. So if they're feeling really fretful and unsettled, often bouncing or shushing or white noise will really help. And you could also try massaging um, and baths, things like that. Just anything that calms your baby down because um, stressed out babies will not feed well, but also um, your stressed out baby will stress you out. And if you've got a stressed out mum and a stressed out baby and everyone's crying, um, that's a really, really toxic situation to be in. Um, and uh, I can pretty much guarantee that um, breastfeeding will not go well in that scenario so everybody needs to calm down um, and then you can try again. So the next thing is to protect your milk supply so if your baby is not feeding well directly from you whether it's at the beginning of breastfeeding or um, towards the um, you know later on um, so with an older baby um, either way you need to protect your milk supply um, you can't wait for your baby to be ready to go back on the breast and just hope that your milk will still be there um, when your baby's ready to go back on. Um, unfortunately, um, your milk supply will reduce if you don't use the milk. So it is a sort of use it or lose it situation really. Um, so protect your milk supply with pumping and um, also using some hand expressing as well. Um, Quite often hand expressing is more effective at um, low volumes, so especially in the early days, um, but also uh, later on um, at any point. Uh, if you pump and then when the pump stops um, getting milk out, then you stop the pump and then hand express. And um, a, a large research study done, uh, I think around 2007, um, found that actually mothers who hand expressed in addition to pumping um, found that their milk production was increased by about 40 to 50 percent by um, the addition of hand expressing as well. So the message here really is that hand expressing isn't the sort of primitive poor relation to pumping. It's actually more effective in lots of ways than using an electric or manual pump. 
And then you also need to have skin to skin because if you're not getting that skin on skin contact from your baby during breastfeeding, um, then uh, the, one of the hormones that makes milk is really um, stimulated a lot by um, skin to skin touch. So you're going to need to um, compensate by having skin to skin contact with your baby. So you can try things like um, uh, bottle feeding um, cheek to breast. Um, you can try having skin to skin in between feedings. Um, you can let um, your partner wear baby skin to skin. Um, you could try wearing a sling. Um, but keeping your baby close to you and in skin to skin contact will help both of you. Um, I've talked a lot about staying calm and I'll come back to that later on. Um, and sometimes um, the reason that uh, this sort of scenario happens in the first place is that um, your milk supply didn't really get established or um, didn't get established well enough. Um, so quite often what happens in the early days is uh, the baby perhaps loses a lot of weight or um, uh, perhaps a supplement is introduced and that doesn't help your milk supply get off to a good start. Um, and then what happens is that your, um, your body doesn't really get the messages it needs um, to make a really good milk supply. So um, if that's you, then um, try um, a few strategies that I'm going to talk about to try and increase your milk supply. So whenever babies don't breastfeed, breastfeed well, whether they have um, not breastfed well ever, or they have started off breastfeeding well, but then um, something's happened and they're no longer breastfeeding well. So often this is when a baby is ill or, um, as I've said, one of those causes of breast refusal. Your milk supply can drop um, and often it's temporary. Um, so don't lose heart because quite often um, when your milk supply drops a little bit, you can get it back again. Um, it really depends on what happens in the early days. Um, if you're confused about this, you could try watching uh, my video on how to uh, get your milk supply set up in the early days of breastfeeding and also um, uh, the video on how milk production works might help you as well. And I suppose I would always start with asking um, a mother what strategies she's already tried to increase her milk supply because um, there are loads and loads of ideas on how to increase milk supply and um, my go-to uh, bible for this subject is um, Diana West and uh, Lisa Marasco's excellent book uh, Making More Milk. Um, that's a really really good book. Um, it's got loads of ideas, um, loads of um, personal but also evidence-based tips um, and lots of um, herbs and um, other supplements that might help you if you're struggling with your milk supply. I can't really uh, improve on what they've written so um, I just really refer you to that book, it's wonderful. Um, but uh, a few ideas just in case you, uh, you can't get that book fast enough or you don't want to buy the book or whatever, that's fine. Um, I would recommend doing things like power pumping. Um, so I love to recommend power pumping because um, it's actually really easy to fit this into a really busy day. Um, and what you do is you set your pump up somewhere where it's not going to get knocked over by a toddler or the dog or whatever. Um, and you would pump for maybe two or three or four minutes maybe. Um, you can do both sides, you can do one side, it doesn't matter. Um, you do um, a very small amount of pumping and then you stop and you just leave the pump uh, and you perhaps come back maybe an hour later or an hour and a half later and you do the same thing. Sort of three, four, maybe five minutes of pumping, one side, two sides, whatever. You make it up as you go along. The point here is that we're trying not to make pumping a really horrible, arduous, difficult task because a lot of times when I'm supporting mothers to increase their milk supply, they've been advised to attempt to feed the baby and then pump for 20 minutes on each side um, and then bottle feed the baby. And to be honest, by the time they've done all of those things, it's basically time to start feeding again. 
and most women just simply cannot sustain that sort of um, uh, regimen. So uh, what ends up happening is they end up pumping less and less and maybe just going down to perhaps one or two pumps a day. Um, and of course that really isn't enough to protect your milk supply. You need to be pumping at least eight to 12 times in 24 hours, including um, at night, unfortunately. Um, I'd love to be able to tell you that if you got 12 hours sleep, you'd make more milk, but it's just not true. Um, and you definitely need to continue those night feeds. They're really, really important for your milk supply. Um, so there's no harm at all in doing a bit of power pumping. Um, you could pump maybe every hour to two hours maybe um, for maybe a four or five or six hour stretch um, and then give yourself a couple of hours off, um, have a nap, whatever, um, and then do a few pumps a day when you definitely empty the breast. Um, so basically there's no rules. You can, um, you can pump till your breasts are completely empty. You can do a combination of pumping and hand expressing. You can power pump for half the day and um, pump to full drainage for the rest of the day. It really doesn't matter. The idea is that you find something that works for you and be flexible and um, don't stress yourself out about um, whether you pump every three hours or whatever because actually babies don't feed like that either. Babies often will do a period of um, cluster feeding and then have a bit of a stretch and then um, have another burst of cluster feeding and then they might have a sleep, then they might feed and then they might have a two or three hour gap and then feed again and then do another cluster feed. So what you're trying to do with the pump is make it work for you, make it fit in with your day um, and you'll find that you're able to sustain pumping better if you're doing that. The other great thing about power pumping is that most women find that they get their biggest volumes quite quickly, so at the beginning of pumping. Um, and yes, you will carry on getting more milk if you pump for longer, um, but actually uh, we're trying to maximise uh, milk production with the minimal amount of effort so that um, it's sustainable and manageable. Um, so uh, doing this type of pumping can work really, really well at low volumes, um, especially if when you pump you get you know, less than 10 mils out. Um, a lot of times when women are getting very low volumes from the pump, they it's almost like they think, oh, well, there's no point. What is the point in all of this effort pumping um, for just a few mils of milk? It's ridiculous. But actually, if you get nine mils and you pump 10 times in the day, actually, that's 90 mils. Um, and hopefully you haven't spent hours and hours and hours getting that 90 mils. And actually, in a few days, your body's going to catch up um, and it's going to realise that you're asking it to make more milk. And then, you know, you're going to have a day when you get 180 mils. And then it'll go up to, I don't know, you know, it's different for everybody. But the point is, your milk supply will respond if you give it the right stimulation. So um, expressing is definitely going to be part of your life if you've got a baby who's not going on the breast. You're going to need to remove milk to feed it to your baby and protect your milk supply. So a combination of power pumping, expressing after feeds if your baby is breastfeeding a little bit, um, expressing instead of feeds, hand expressing, um, anything that works. And there are a few foods and herbs that um, seem to help some women um, increase their milk supply. So um, things like oats and fennel are well known for increasing milk supply. Oats in particular have been used for decades in the dairy industry to boost milk production. Um, and some, uh, some other foodstuffs um, like fenugreek and malungai. Now fenugreek is an Indian herb used in cooking and it's also used to flavour artificial maple syrup. Um, fenugreek does have a number of side effects and um, you also need to take a lot of it for it to make any real difference. Um, uh, you shouldn't take it if you're asthmatic or diabetic. So there are a few ifs and buts with fenugreek. Um, so it's not perhaps 
the most recommended um, uh, supplement these days. Um, there are um, quite a few studies that have shown that um, the Indonesian um, leafy vegetable malungai and the Indian Ayurvedic herb Shatavari um, actually does increase milk supply very successfully um, and they are just um, a one to two capsule a day supplement um, with no uh, major reported side effects um, so uh, they're my top favorite substances at the moment for um, helping mothers with their milk supply and um, I put domperidone um, on this list as well it's really not recommended and in many countries it's it won't be prescribed at all um, it's a drug that's used um, sometimes to manage um, gastroesophageal reflux usually in adults um, and one of the side effects is that it raises your prolactin level and um, as you might know prolactin is the hormone that makes milk and so um, in a number of studies of premature babies in particular uh, mothers of preterm babies taking domperidone were able to um, fairly significantly increase their milk supply Unfortunately, there are a lot of side effects to domperidone. Some of them are um, uh, not great. And so um, I put it on this list because some people do still um, uh, get some domperidone, but um, you may find it difficult to um, get anybody who will support your taking domperidone. So I would check with your, your local... Um, your doctor or uh, lactation consultant nearby and just see if it's um, something that might work for you but uh, it's just a warning really that um, it might be hard to come by and the third step is to coax your baby back to the breast um, so we're definitely not talking about forcing your baby um, because we really want to avoid any negative experiences at the breast um, so this is just a very stressful toxic situation which we definitely don't want. So we want to have gentle handling of your baby, lots of staying calm, stroking, talking to your baby um, and there are a few other techniques um, so I would usually recommend co-bathing as well. Um, so unless you're uh, very newly um, delivered and you have stitches, co-bathing is an amazing um, technique for coaxing babies back to the breast. Um, it seems to almost reboot babies um, and make them forget negative experiences at the breast and just sort of start from scratch. So what you do is you get in a bath that is the right temperature for your baby and you have the water just lapping your tummy and then you need to get um, a helper, so your partner or a family member or someone that you don't mind seeing you in, uh, in your birthday suit or if you're shy you could wear bikini bottoms or whatever if it's a, a friend helping you out um, but anyway they lower the baby into the bath water um, to about chest depth and then they bring the baby up onto your chest and tummy and you and your baby would just have some time skin to skin in the bath you could put a flannel over your baby's back and just lap water over their back to keep them warm and the idea is that this is supposed to reboot your baby and keep your baby calm and settled. So it should be a very lovely, uh, relaxing, soothing experience. Um, and I've known a number of women um, with severe breast refusal with their babies. Um, and this was the only thing um, that got their baby back on the breast. So it's really worth considering um, if you possibly can try it. Um, it's also completely harmless. Uh, and uh, if nothing else, both of you are going to get clean, so uh, there's really nothing to lose with this strategy. Um, and then the idea would be that uh, if you did co-bathing or if you weren't able to do co-bathing, for example, if you had just had a caesarean section or you had um, lots of stitches, um, perhaps you weren't comfortable with the idea, um, then definitely um, skin to skin, so spending as much time in skin to skin contact with your baby as you possibly can. Often babies don't like being held in those um, sort of traditional mother led cradle hold positions with um, mum sitting upright and baby sort of held along her arm. 
Uh, a lot of babies really hate this position because um, it's that beetle on the back sensation that I was talking about earlier. Um, and so uh, uh, for a lot of babies, the solution to that feeling of being out of control is to feed lying down. Um, so either mum and baby both lying on their sides um, so that the baby can um, feed whilst just being supported by the bed. And then you would just guide your baby um, uh, onto your breast whilst lying down and this is often less stressful for babies or you could try uh, a reclined position um, uh, so a little bit like the image you can see here you might try um, just uh, leaning back maybe just propped with a couple of pillows um, and just see if your baby will get onto the breast all by themselves um, also try feeding while your baby is very sleepy so either when they're about to go to sleep or as they're waking up from a sleep, this can sometimes um, sort of not quite trick them, but um, they sort of don't realise what's happening. And before they know it, they're back on the breast and um, it's all going well. So sometimes that works. Bizarrely, sometimes feeding whilst walking around um, is a good strategy, a little bit like the yoga ball idea. Um, it just seems to distract babies. And finally, um, uh, Christina Smiley, um, who is um, a doctor and lactation consultant, um, uh, talks a lot about starting on the bottle and finishing on the breast. Um, and you might think that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, I'll explain. So the problem with starting on the breast is that quite often when babies have had bottles and they've got used to that fast flow if they've not been um, bottle fed using that paste bottle feeding technique is that um, the baby when they're very hungry um, will not be patient with the slow flow from the breast so what happens when the baby goes to the breast is they begin to fight uh, they might start hitting arching their back squirming crying um, they will often sort of um, punch the breast um, and really be unhappy. Uh, they don't feed effectively when they're like that. And what you'll feel as a mum is really, really stressed out. You'll feel um, rejected by your baby quite likely. Um, and this is a very, very toxic situation. And what's going to happen as well is your stress levels are going to rise and that will inhibit your um, letdown reflex. So it stops oxytocin working properly. And so the whole feed becomes a bit of a disaster. So the baby is not getting um, uh, a lot of flow from the breast because mummy is stressed out. So um, her letdown reflex isn't working well. Baby doesn't um, feed well. Um, the baby gets frustrated long before they've actually finished the breast um, and the less milk we remove from the breast, the, um, the less milk the breast is going to make. So uh, it's that use it or lose it thing again. And so what ends up happening is after this fight, um, uh, mum will understandably stop this um, and go ahead and give her baby a bottle and what ends up happening is the baby gets more and more and more milk from the bottle and uh, the more milk they get from the bottle um, the more frustrated they get with the breast and what sometimes seems to happen is that the baby almost doesn't associate the breast with food um, so it's it's still lovely for the baby the baby is not rejecting mum so if this is happening to you your baby doesn't hate you your baby doesn't hate breastfeeding your baby doesn't hate your milk it's nothing to do with that it's just that they have come to not really associate being on the breast when they're hungry with getting food um, for usually lots of different reasons so you need to basically stop this horrible toxic negative spiral and one way to do that is by starting on the bottle and finishing on the breast. So really, um, I've already said I want to credit Christina Smiley with this idea because um, uh, as far as I'm aware, she is the first person to um, actually talk about it. Although it's something that um, a lot of mums and, and, and lactation consultants as well have noticed for a long time. <coughs> 
So um, the reason we would finish at the breast is because it helps the baby to get that lovely feeling of fullness and satisfaction on the breast, not the bottle. So if baby is more patient because um, he or she isn't really, really hungry, they're more likely to um, actually feed effectively on the breast. Um, they will be more happy with the slower flow rate from the breast if they're not starving hungry. And that means that the baby is actually going to feed more effectively. The baby will empty the breast to a greater extent, which is going to help milk supply. Um, but also, the baby falls off the breast with that lovely punch drunk feeling. Um, and that feels really good as a mum when your baby gets that really drunk feeling um, on the breast, when they're really content and happy. And you don't really want baby to be fighting the breast and then falling asleep happy and content on the bottle. That's going to make you feel really, really inadequate. So you want to reverse that situation and let the baby take out their frustration and um, uh, hunger on the bottle initially and then finish on the breast and end up calm and happy. And what you would do, you're going to need to play around a little bit with the amounts, but what I usually suggest is giving about 50 to 75% of the usual supplement that the baby gets with the bottle. And you want to obviously bottle feed using that paste bottle feeding technique. And then you would put the baby back to the breast. And this is where you're going to need to experiment a little bit because you might need to do a little bit less um, of the top up, whether it's expressed milk or formula um, first, or you might need to do a little bit more. Because the bottom line is you want the baby to um, be calm enough that they will breastfeed, but you don't want them to be so full that they won't feed effectively. So um, you might need to get this um, wrong a few times before you hit on the right kind of balance. Um, and what you would also do is when you put the baby on the breast, you would use um, some breast compressions. So uh, you would... Um, uh, squeeze your breast with your hand it shouldn't hurt so if you're if it's hurting you're probably squeezing a little too hard but you want to hold squeeze and hold um, to really maximize the amount of milk that your baby um, gets from the breast that will really positively reinforce his efforts on the breast so that he gets a really really good feed um, and as soon as the baby starts being squirmy or agitated you would quickly put the baby on the other breast um, and do the same thing. Um, so you can keep switching breasts if you need to, um, to keep the baby interested and keep the flow rate as high as possible. And then you would um, begin to offer less and less with the bottle um, until the baby is only having a very small um, bottle supplement and then finishing the feed on the breast. Um, and ultimately, um, hopefully, you'll be able to eliminate the bottle and just have your baby breastfeeding. I've already talked a little bit about the supplemental nursing system and the cup. Um, another device that sometimes helps when babies um, get very, very used to um, silicone bottles is using a shield. Um, so the shield is um, definitely not something that you would instantly reach for. Um, you would definitely try the other techniques first because there are um, some... Uh, negatives of using a nipple shield, um, mostly that babies can just get a bit addicted to them um, and so sometimes it can be a little tricky to get a baby off a shield um, but also um, sometimes uh, it can reduce um, the sort of skin to skin um, experience for mum and baby. Some mums don't particularly like using shields, um, some mums report that um, uh, they, they don't get quite as much um, milk production with them, so they need to carry on pumping to maintain their milk supply. But they can be a really good tool if a baby is um, really, really used to bottles. Um, it can be a good way of coaxing the baby back to the breast. But um, you may or may not have figured out already that there is a right and a wrong way to put a nipple shield on. Um, so it's not as simple as just... Um, sticking the nipple shield onto your uh, breast and areola and hoping for the best. Um, if you can, if you see uh, the picture on the left, uh, that nipple shield is 
barely going to stay on the breast. Um, and what's probably going to happen is as soon as the baby gets near, um, they will sort of flick the nipple shield off. And this is a really frustrating, annoying situation to find yourself in. Um, so what you want to do is end up with a nipple shield that's really, really firmly on the breast. Also with as much um, nipple and areola in um, the teat of the nipple shield as possible because that's going to maximise the efficiency of the feed. So you can see the picture on the right, uh, that nipple shield is really stuck down all around the breast um, and there's plenty of areola and nipple in the shield. And the way you do that is by inverting the nipple shield first. So uh, the picture on the left is me um, inverting that nipple shield. So you turn it half inside out and then you grab hold of what's left that you can feel of the, um, the teat part of the nipple shield and you grab um, that on either side and then if you can see uh, the picture on the right hand side that's when you would um, you would get that end part of the teat of the nipple shield and push that down over the nipple um, and that will maximize the amount of nipple and areola in the teat of the nipple shield. The other thing you can do, um, I haven't used it on this model, um, but you can use a little bit of um, lanolin ointment um, just to try and stick the nipple shield down. So uh, you, you, if you do both strategies, so inverting it and rolling it down, as well as using Lansano, um, you'll have a, a nipple shield that's pretty well stuck on and it's not going to ping off and the baby will have a lot of breast tissue in their mouth as well. And then finally, just a few words about staying calm because um, it can be very difficult to stay relaxed um, while you're worried and anxious about whether breastfeeding is going to um, come right again. Um, so I usually suggest that mums just try to take the pressure off themselves by setting really, really small short term goals. So, you know, you might say, look, let's just get through today. And then when you've got through today, say, right, I really want to make it to the weekend. Uh, let's see if we can stick it out till the weekend. And then you might say, right, I've made it through the weekend. I'm going to try um, and keep going with maximising my milk reproduction. And I'm going to you know, carry on with the pace buffer feeding until the end of Tuesday. And then you know, we'll regroup and we'll have another think about how it's going and whether we're making any progress. Um, because if you um, immediately set yourself an ambitious breastfeeding target when it's all going a little bit wrong um, that will make you feel very very stressed out so just take it you know one day or a couple of days at a time and you'll feel much less under pressure and it's also really important to retain your sense of perspective so um, milk is really really important um, and I, I'm not minimising the importance of milk. I wouldn't be a lactation consultant if I didn't think that milk was really important, but it's not the only part of mothering. Um, and so please remember to enjoy all the lovely bits of mothering that you can still do. So remember to keep cuddling and stroking and holding your baby. Remember to enjoy bathing with your baby. Um, Remember to enjoy singing and talking to your baby and all of that lovely stuff and just try um, to take the pressure off. And you're also going to need a support crew because if you're working hard to maintain your milk supply and keep your baby calm and you're trying to stay calm yourself, you really need help from other people. Um, so accept offers of help, um, dip into your freezer stash, order takeaway, um, order you know food that's really easy to prepare and cook um, but take as much pressure off yourself as you possibly can because you need your um, uh, your patience and your energy reserves for working on the breastfeeding and um, there is a fair bit of evidence that um, acupressure and acupuncture um, will increase your oxytocin response so if you're interested in alternative therapies then those would definitely be a good idea. There's um, actually quite a lot of evidence that 
um, that these work and that they also increase milk supply as well. Um, even if you don't go for that, um, then get somebody to just give you a really, really good neck and back and shoulder rub uh, because there are lots of pressure points around your neck and your collarbone um, that seem to help with oxytocin. Um, and remember to keep snacking. So really what you eat and drink won't affect your milk supply um, uh, apart from, you know, if it's oats and fennel. But apart from that, really, um, you can basically... Um, eat anything and still produce good quality milk for your baby. Uh, of course you get the leftovers and what you don't want is to feel run down and um, uh, underfed and hungry because that will make you feel more stressed out. So you need to keep eating but just understand that it's for your benefit not for your baby's benefit. The same thing goes for drinking. If your urine is pale yellow then you're drinking enough to make plenty of milk for your baby. But just keep your energy levels topped up because if you get hungry, um, lots of women find that they get very irritable and um, depressed if they get hungry. So um, keep snacking to stop that happening. I really do wish you all the best um, and lots of luck in overcoming your baby's nursing strike. I hope that's helped and uh, thanks for watching.